Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Debunking the Missionaries. As read by Moshe Shulman tonight, the virgin birth is going to be our hot topic. So sit tight and enjoy the evening. Rabbi, welcome back. Hello, how are you doing? I'm just bringing you up here so I can see people. Oh, doing well, doing well. You'll have just a few seconds of, of a no video feed. There we go, but we're back on there. Yes, indeed. All right. So there we go. So our topic is going to be spicy one for sure. One second. I didn't get it right. Okay. Let's try again. All righty. Okay. Live chat is here. Good. So I can see you. Although it's very difficult to watch as you're going along, but uh, right. live chat is here. Okay. We are now continuing to do our examination. Okay. Let's go back to the eating here. Okay. We are now, we're dealing with the New Testament. And discussing and examining, is the New Testament really history, or is it maybe basically fiction? Now, what we did is we discussed, we went over the birth narratives in Matthew and Luke. <clears throat> we pointed out some of the differences. And now we're going to an analysis, an in-depth analysis of each one of them to analyze them as far as veracity is concerned. Should we really trust them? So last week, we basically discussed the genealogy that appears in Matthew. Now, of course, it's well known that the difference between the genealogies in Matthew and the genealogies in, in Luke, and there are a whole bunch of answers given to how those are different and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> to me, that's, that's, that's a very, very minor error. I mean, maybe that might bother somebody who's involved in inerrancy, but I'm not worried about the inerrancy issue at the moment. What is interesting is Matthew is trying to bring proofs uh, based on what we notice is Matthew's way of dealing with it, is trying to bring proofs based on biblical text or um, something like that. So my analysis last week, of course, dealt with why were there three times 14 generations. And I brought from Philo, um, what to me at least is interesting, although other people might, how the number 14 has a significance since it shows a, something coming to mature, maturation which would be what would happen at the end of each of the 14 generations. Something comes uh, from Abraham to David, and, uh, and three times the number three being significant in that there's three elements in the world. Um, something that for somebody who would be steeped in um, the Greek ideas at that time, which Matthew's audience would be since it was written in Greek, since the Greek ideas at the time, <coughs> that they would know that, that, that um, they would essentially, you know, find that extremely, you know, interesting, almost as if it were, had been a biblical, um, almost as if it had been a biblical uh, prophecy. So now we're going to continue with Matthew. We're going to deal with verses 18 through 23, and it probably will take us two sessions at least to cover because there's a lot of material. So let's read what it says here. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be a child from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, again, I told you before, I think last time we went through this, that what that means is in Jewish law, there's two things. There's the engagement, where you are considered biblically as if you were married, uh, so that you, you would require a divorce, and if she would have committed adultery, she would have actually been punished as if a married woman punished. And then the actual marriage ceremony, which apparently is their holding between these two people. Okay. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and willing to expose her to public disgrace, plans to dismiss her quietly. <coughs> uh, but just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, remember again, when we talked about the differences between Luke and Matthew, we pointed out that, in fact, Mary had been told before she became pregnant she was going to become pregnant. And here Joseph was told afterwards with somewhat of a contradiction. Since after Mary knew she was pregnant. So when Joseph found out, why didn't Mary tell, hey, listen, an angel came to me and told me what's going on. Um, Mary was going to tell and then the angel came. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. <clears throat> now, one thing you should point out here. If Matthew was originally written in Hebrew, why does it have to 
translate a manual. Everybody who knows Hebrew knows what a manual means. A manual means God with us. So why was it translated into it? This is another proof to something that's been pretty well known and documented. That in fact, Matthew was originally written, this, the Matthew we have is originally written in Greek, and as I mentioned when I discussed the text of the New Testament, that what Papias is referring to as the Gospel of Matthew was probably a sayings gospel, maybe part of it actually amended into this Matthew, but it wasn't this Matthew. This Matthew was actually written by a Greek writer for Greek people. It was not written by an Aramaic or Hebrew-speaking person for anybody else. So the reason why it says Emmanuel, he has to translate it is because he's, he's written in Greek for somebody, for Greeks, and not for um, people who would actually know what this is. So here we have the virgin birth, 714, supposedly a prophecy telling us that the Messiah in the future will be born from a virgin. This is what is believed by Christians. You're going to have a lot of, there's a lot of arguments. We're going to go through a lot of those. But this is basically what it is. Now, before we can even discuss it, and before I can even explain to you what the real understanding of this is, we have to get some history. Okay? Now, the best ways to understand is that Isaiah is actually talking about real people. This is something Christians forget and don't seem to hop, don't seem to, to, to comprehend. Isaiah is talking real history. What do I mean by real history? Real people, real things were happening. These are not, you know, um, you know, like a novel, a historical type of novel. This is a true recounting of history, and Isaiah has his part in that true history. So in order to understand Isaiah 7, Isaiah spoke in a certain period of time. If you look at Isaiah 1, you'll see that he says specifically when he's speaking. <clears throat> it says, these are the vision of Yeshua ben Omar, <clears throat> that he saw, that he, he prophesied, that he saw concerning uh, Yehuda of Yeshua, that means the southern kingdom. Himai is Yui, the king is Yui, Yoisa, Ahaz, the kings of Judah. So he, he lived in a certain historical period of time. So in order even to understand a prophecy which is given in that time, it, it's important to understand what was the historical background. Now, if you ever ask any Christians about what it is, basically the only historical background they understand is what it says in the first few verses. But we have two books that deal with the history the Book of Kings and the Book of uh, Divrei Yom Chronicles, both of them deal with the kings of Judah and what happened to them. So why not look there first and see, okay, well, what what is the historical background? What was going on for King Ahaz? What's going on in his period? Why is uh, Yeshayu? Why is uh, Isaiah the prophet coming to him? What is he talking? What is a historical prophet? What's going on historically? So where we have to look is we have to look in the Second Book of Kings. Oops, I went too far. Second book of Kings, chapter 16. Now, chapter 16 starts off with Ahaz becoming king. Now, what's very important is you have to realize that some of the names you're going to see here are going to be very important in Isaiah, so you should know who they are. So, um, I guess I'll, to make it quicker, I'm going to read straightly from the, the, the art, art scroll. But I, I might look over and change something. In the 17th year of Pekach ben Remalia, Pekach ben Remalia was the king of the northern kingdom. Ahaz, son of Yerushalayim, king of Judah, became king. So this is when Ahaz becomes king, in the 17th year of Pekach. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 16 years in Jerusalem. So for 16 years, he was king. He did not do what was proper in the eyes of Hashem, his God, as David, his father, had done. So all the kings, if you're familiar with the book of Kings, you will know that all the kings are always compared to King David because King David was the righteous king of excellence. As it says, there was only one thing that he seen about with, with the, the Indian from Bathsheba, otherwise there was no sin. He went the way of the kings of Israel, this northern kingdom, the northern kingdom. <coughs> if you've read the book of Kings, then you know the northern kingdom, they set up idols and they worship all the idols as the people around them did. He even passed his son through the fire like the abominations of the nations whom Hashem had driven out before the children of Israel. That's a very well-known kind of thing. Moloch was called where you'd, you'd split a <coughs> fire and have your son go through it. He also sacrificed and burned incense, incense to high places. 
<coughs> these are private altars which were forbidden and upon the hilltops and on every leafy tree. He basically um, hedged his bet and served every kind of, kind of god that there was around in his time. So what happened? After this, his son, king of Aram, and Kachbet, the son of Adamalia, king of Israel, went to do battle against Jerusalem. They besieged Akaz, but could not defeat him. So what happens is, and this is really the context what's going on, Ahaz is being attacked by these two kings. At that time, Ritzin, king of Aram, restored Eliad to Aram, and he evicted the Jews from Elad. So uh, he took over somewhere. Edomite's son came to Elad and dwelled there to this day. So certain areas were taken away from um, the kingdom of Judah. Ahaz sent Meshach to take the place of the king of Assyria, saying, your servant and your son am I. So what did Ahaz do? Instead of listening to Hashem and repenting, he sent to Assyria to join in him to help in his against his enemies. Now, if you know your geography, what you have is, I'm going to sort of draw it out here. Let's say you have the Judah here. You have around it Israel. To the side here is Aram, basically Syria. And Assyria is farther out there. But Assyria was a much larger king. Aram was a smaller king. Assyria was already at that time a big, pretty much of an empire. Okay? <clears throat> so basically what he's saying is, listen, he's going to go around Adam. He knows Adam's enemy is Assyria. So he's going to Assyria and ask Assyria to help him out. Uh, come and save the clutch of the king of Adam and from the clutch of the king of Israel are rising up against him. So he's trying to make a, uh, you know, this is real politics. This is Middle Eastern politics. We see it today. Israel is now making peace, with, you know, has made peace with uh with the uh, United Arab Emirates and things like that. Why? Because of, of uh, Iran. So these countries are making peace. Saudi Arabia is probably going to make peace with Israel sometime soon also. Because all of these countries, it's, that's the way the politics goes in the area. Your friends today, enemies tomorrow, because of the whole thing there. So this kind of politics has been going on a long time. Ahaz would have a silver and gold found in the temple of Shem and the treasures of the king's palace and sent a bribe to the king of Syria. So how did he get it? Why? He sent a bribe. The king of Syria heeded him. The king of Syria went from Damascus and seized it, exiled the Thomas of Kir and killed it. So, the king of Damascus, Ritzin, was deposed, and all of the family, were, they were all exiled. That's what Assyria did. Assyria basically would come in, unlike the Babylonians later, or the uh, Persians, they would come in, and they would exile people and just they'd get wiped out off the face of the earth. King Ahaz went to greet uh, to take the palace in Damascus. He saw the altar that was in Damascus, and King Ahaz sent the model of the altar and his plans according to us were to Uriah the Kohen. So what he says, he sees there that there's, there's idolatrous altars and does that. Uriah the Kohen then built the altar according to everything King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah the Kohen did before King Ahaz arrived from Damascus. So he made this. Then the king arrived from Damascus. The king saw the altar. The king approached the altar and offered upon it. Okay, so by the way, one of his kings, or well, the two kings were already gone. He burned his elevation offering and his meal offering, poured out elevation, spring the blood of the peace offering upon the altar. So what come, comes home? He comes back home and he offers uh, an offering that was in the left. And as for the copper altar that was before Shem, that's the altar, the copper altar's altar, which is for the incense. Um, there are different altars there. Um, eventually, I'm going to do deal with sin atonement, and so I'll, I'll go into a little bit about the temple sacrifice system and the things in the temple. But there was there were a couple of altars. One altar was a call, altar for intents, which were made from copper. Then there was a big altar, which were the sacrifices, which the sacrifices were burned, and the blood offerings were sprinkled around it on its sides and then poured at the side. That's we'll get into more in detail, but. Um, that's what he's talking about here. Uh, drew close to the end of the sanctuary, between the altar and the temple of Hashem, and placed in the northern side of the altar. King Ahaz commanded the Uriah the Kohen, saying, Upon the great altar, you shall burn the elevation offerings in the morning, and the middle offerings in the evening. The elevation of the king, and the middle offerings. This is the place where, that's the big main altar. The elevation of the general populace, and the middle of the elevations, and the blood of all elevation offerings, the blood of any sacrifice, you shall sprinkle upon it. Again, they shall sprinkle on it. The copper offering will, not, will be for me to visit. The Kohen did according to all the king's commands. So he, you know, he, uh, Basically, went around and did he wanted to do. Okay, King, uh, King Ahaz cut off the stands of the lovers, all kinds of stuff that he did. This stuff is not Nagaya, just you know that we're dealing with a real story here. Things really happened. There's a King Ahaz, he lived, he did things. He was a really rotten guy. 
He was rebellious against Hashem. So it's telling you actually what it was. But the first thing he did is, is the Syria took care of Damascus. So one of his kings got to take care of. That we'll see about. Cast off the sands of lavers. Uh, things that are used to wash the hands. Um, yeah, I'm Okay. And he moved the laver with them and he took it down the sea from the copper oxen that were upon it. And of course, when he moved the Sabbath awning that they had built. In the temple, he routed the king's outer, temp- uh, outer entrance, go directly to the temple of Hashem out of here for the king of Syria. Okay, the rest of the deeds of Achaz that he did, behold, they are recorded in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah. We're going to go to the book of Chronicles. I do not know if this is the same book. There's some question about that. Achaz lay with his forefathers and was buried with his forefathers in the city of David. His son, Chazkiyui, Chazakayim, in English, reigned in his place. Okay, so that's his, that's his life. Now, what else do we see here? In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king over Israel and Samaria. That means the second king was gone. Pekach ben Menaliah is gone in his twelfth year. Now remember, he, he was king for a total of 16 years. So in his twelfth year, he, his second, the second king that, that oppressed him died. Okay? The second king that oppressed him died. Okay, um, and then it basically talks about Hamas Okay, that's not so. That's not the guide to Isaiah seven fourteen. It's only it only relates to seven fourteen in the sense that we see that within Ahaz's lifetime, we see that number one, um, Assyria came and destroyed the king of Damascus from Aram, and then later the king of uh, Samaria, which is the northern kingdom, is also killed. Okay, so when referring to the two kings, when Isaiah 747 refers to the two kings, we see the history. What happened is, is, is actually in King Ahaz's lifetime, by the 12th year of his reign, they're both gone. Both gone. Okay. Now let's go to the book of Chronicles, chapter 20 in the book of Chronicles. Second book of Chronicles. Chapter 28. Okay, so let's see what Chronicles has to say. Chronicles many times, the book of Chronicles is interesting because the book of Chronicles is primarily about the kings of Yehuda, the southern kingdom. Okay, that's what it primarily talks about. Um, whereas the book of Kings itself discusses about the northern and southern kingdom. So if you look at the book of Chronicles, you find more information because of the kings of Judah because it concentrates more of them, whereas the book of Kings concentrates on both kingdoms and the interactions to each other and what happens. So that's that's the primary difference between the two of them if, you, um, if you're familiar with these things and um, if you read them. Okay. Page 28. Uh, chapter 20, excuse me. Ahaz became 20 when he became king and he reigned for 16 years in Jerusalem. Okay, same. He did not do what was proper in the eyes of Hashem, as David had done. He went in the ways of the kings of Israel. He even made molten idols for Baal. He also burned incense in the valley of Bin Hinnon and set his sons aflame. Like the abominations of the nations when, uh, whom Hashem had driven out before the children of Israel, he also sacrificed burnt incense at the high places, upon the high hilltops, upon every leaf. So it, it's, it's very similar to what's in Kings, of course, because it's talking about the same person. Hashem has, has delivered him from the hand of the king of Aram, struck him and took a large number of captives from him, taking them to Damascus. He was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who delivered a great blow to him. The conquered army killed a hundred. Okay, again. Hashem, Hashem, his God, delivered him into the hands of the king of Aram. Okay, we're talking about now about the two kings um, that were oppressing him, which is the historical background for Isaiah 7. Hashem, his God, delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram, struck him and took a large number of captives from him, taking them to Damascus. He was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who did the great blow to him, Pekach ben Amalia. So Amalia killed 120,000 people in Judah in one day. All of them might have been, for they had forsaken Hashem, God of the fathers. Zichri war from Ephraim killed Messiah, the king's son, Zacharim, the chairman of Passover, Elkanah, the deputy of the king. 
children of Israel okay, have 200,000 boys and girls, they also planted much booty with them and brought the booty to Shemaz. So we notice that Chronicles, again, is many times much more in depth about the events, which we'll find in the Book of Kings, only told, told in short. Okay, um, Book of Chronicles is interested in a chronicle of the kings of Judah, primarily. And the Book of Kings is about the kings of Judah and, Yehud, and um, Israel, and is talking about it in a much different way, much more like you see it as a more spiritual type of thing. Uh, there was a prophet of Shem there by the name of Odin. He went out before the army that was arriving in Samaria and said to him, Behold, because the wrath of Hashem, God of your fathers against Judah, he delivered them into your hands and you killed among them with the rage that reached very high in the heavens, very heavens. And now you propose to trouble the people of Judah and Jerusalem as slaves and made them to yourself. Behold, this will only bring guilt upon you to Hashem, your God. So now listen to me and return the captives whom you have captured from your brothers from the burning wrath of Hashem is upon This, of course, doesn't bring your case. Some met on the heads of, uh, of the children of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Yohachanan. Um, I hate some of these pronunciations. Sorry, Ben Yohachanan, Berachia Ben Mishlaimos, Yiches Kiyui, son of Shalom, and Amasa Ben Chalon. Uh, so for those who are returning from the battle, he said to them, do not bring the captives here, for you are thus proposing to incur guilt from God upon us, to aid unto our sins and guilt, for we have much guilt and burning wrath against Israel. And then the fighters released the captives and spoils before the officers of the entire congregation. The men who had been mentioned by name then got up and gave assistance to captives. They dressed all their uncalled people from the spoils. They dressed them, gave them shoes, fed them, gave them to drink, anointed them, led all the faint ones on donkeys. They brought them to Jericho, the city of Palms, to the kinsmen, and then returned to Samaria. So Jericho is not far from Jerusalem, if you know. At that time, Ki Acha sent to the kings of Syria to come to his aid. Furthermore, the Edomites came and struck Judah, captured captives, and the Philistines spread out in the cities of the lowlands, south of Judah, and captured Beth Shemesh, Ahilon, Gederet, Soho, and its villages, Himna, and its villages, Gimza, and its villages, and they settled there. For Shem had humbled Judah because of Acha's king of Israel, for he had led Judah to disgrace and betrayed Hashem. Okay, verse 20. Tiglath Pilnissa, king of Assyria, attacked him and besieged him, and he was not able to welcome him. Although Ach had taken a portion from the temple of Hashem and from the palace of the king and the officers sending it to Assyria, it did not help him. In the midst of his portion here, King Achaz added to his betrayal of Hashem. He sacrificed the gods of Damascus. We heard a little bit about that also, who were attacking him, <coughs> saying the gods of King Adam are helping them. I will sacrifice to them so they will help me. But they were a cause of damn for him and for all of Israel. Achaz also gathered together the articles of the temple of God. He cut up the articles of the temple of God. He shut the doors of the temple of Shem. And he made himself altars at every corner of Jerusalem and every city in Judah. He made high places to burn incense to other gods, angry from God of his father. So we see here really how wicked he was. The rest of his deeds and all the earlier and later ways, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. That may be referring to the book of kings, I'm not really sure. Achaz lay with his forefathers and buried him in the city of Jerusalem. But they did not bring him unto the tombs of the kings of Israel because he was wicked. The wicked kings, by the way, were not married among the kings. They were married in other places. His son, Cheskiui, uh, has a quiet reigned in his place. Okay, that's chapter 20. So what have we seen so far? We see historically what's going on. We see, we have a king, Ahaz, who is described in both places for his absolute wickedness and rebellion against God, who is being oppressed by two kings, the king of Aram and the king of Israel. Chachban Amalia, and it's the king of Adam. Okay, so what happens basically is he sees that he does it. Rather than turning to Hashem, what does he do? He turns to bribery to Assyria, and he eventually does get out of it through his bribery and through his idolatry. Okay, so interesting enough, we see this constantly. It's a constant theme that Hashem, rather than destroying his righteous people around the temple, he he, you know, he uh, is long-suffering. Now we can look at Isaiah 7. Okay, before I see Isaiah 7. Having read what's there, Isaiah 7 should be simple. But let me just see if there's any quick questions here.
Looks like somebody's trying to put one through. Let me see if I can figure out what it is here. Yeah. Uh, Larry just mentioned to the people to tag to knock talk in uh, in the post so that way I can see it pretty easily. It'll show up orange on my side. Makes it easy to spot. Julius, good to see you back, girl. Good. Hopefully your uh, your shoulders healing well. That'd be good. Yeah, I don't see the question anywhere. All right. Okay, somebody asked something about scribal error. I'm not really sure what he's trying to say. Oh, I see it right there. The I, I, have no, I don't know of any scribal errors here. The issues here involving uh, Isaiah 7 and 7.14 do not involve scribal errors at all. None of the discussions I know of deal with scribal errors. So what we want to do is... Okay. <clears throat> Let's deal with chapter seven. Let's over here a second. So again, we've had the historical background. We know that Achas is a wicked king, and we know that um, he's being oppressed by two kingdoms. Kingdom of Israel, the Northern Kingdom, and also by the King of Adam, who are in league together, and he's in he's in uh, pretty hot water. It's not very comfortable for him. So what happens is Isaiah is sent to him. So let's see what happens. It happened in the days of Ahaz, the son of Yosem, son of Zia, King of Judah. Okay, you know that. The Tzin, King of Aram, and Pakach ben Menamali, the King of Israel went up to wage war against Jerusalem, but he could not triumph over it. It was told to the house of David, saying, Aram has joined with Ephraim, and his heart shuddered, and the heart of his people like the shuddering of the trees of the forest in the wind. So they were very much afraid from what's going to happen. Now we have to understand what the reason is. We'll get into this more in the future. But we have to understand, um, when, when such a thing happened, the whole royal family would be wiped out. We're going to see this coming up. We're going to discuss this a little bit later by those who think that there's a difference between speaking to the house of David as opposed to the king. There's not, and I will get into that more in detail. But um, what's, the, everybody is afraid, from the king on down to anybody who's in the royal family. Hashem said to his, uh, Isaiah, Shayu, go out and meet Ahaz, you and your son, Sha'yusha. Sha'yusha means a remnant will return. It's very important to remember that. His name was Sha'yusha, a remnant will return. At the edge of the channel of the upper pool, at, at the road of the la launderer's field, and say to him, Be calm and still, fear not. Let your heart not grow faint before these two smoldering spent firebrands, before the wrath of Ritzin and Aram, and bef before the son of Amalia. Because Aram, along with Ephraim, Ephraim is another name for the northern kingdom, and the son of Amalia has counseled evil against you, saying, let us attack Judah and vex it and angst it to ourselves and crown the son of Tabeel as king within it. Okay, this is not mentioned there, but this is important. What is the purpose of the overthrowing in Judah? It's to place another royal family in Judah. Keep this in the back of mind. We're going to talk about this again. It's going to come up again and again. It's very important. This verse is extremely important to understand what's going on here. Again, verse 6. What are they saying? Let us attack Judah and vex it and annex it to ourselves and crown the son of Tobiel as king within it. Okay, Tobiel was not from the house of David. Thus said my word, Hashem, Lutin, it shall not endure and it shall not be. So what is Hashem doing here? Very important. The promise to the kingdom of Judah was is that the, 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 the descendants of David would continue to rule. The northern kingdom rebelled against the house of David, the son of King Solomon, Choivam, they rebelled against them, and they split off. So only in the southern kingdom of Judah was the house of David continued, and the house of David has a promise from Hashem that that is the royal house of the Jewish people forever. Okay? So 
Hashem steps in, even though Achas was a wicked person. Hashem steps in and says, listen, my promise is basically to house of David, no matter who you are, you are the ones who I'm going to save. So I'm going to save the king in the house of David completely. For the capital of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Sin. In 65 more years, Ephraim will cease to be a people. So he's giving a prophecy here. In 65 years, Ephraim is going to disappear completely. And the capital of Ephraim is Samaria. And the, Samaria, my, uh, the head of Samaria is the son of Amalia. If you do not believe this, it is because you lack faith. So what is Isaiah saying? He said, listen, you're worried about that, um, and you're worried about the northern kingdom. First you should know, Adam, their time's coming soon. 65 years, they're gone completely. Now we saw the kingdom, was, 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 was killed earlier. But the kingdom, it's a whole kingdom of Aram is going to be gobbled up by Assyria. And also, by the way, the whole kingdom of Israel gets gobbled up by Assyria. But the point of the matter here is Isaiah's come, hey, listen, you're worried about these people? They're going to be gone. Your kingdom's still going to be here. What are you worried about? Hashem further spoke further to Ahaz, saying, now, he changed. after telling him that, listen, you're going to disappear. You're going to be here. They're going to be gone. What are you worried about? They're going to be gone. You're going to be here. Request a sign for yourself from Hashem, your God, request it to the depths of the high above. Listen, if you don't believe me, because you worship all these other, ask a sign. So all, what happens? All of a sudden he gets very from, gets very religious. Okay? He's worshiped all the gods there. Hashem says, listen, ask me a sign. He gets very religious. You know, this, this is a, you know, you, this is a sign of <laughs> hypocrisy. Says, like, all of a sudden he gets very religious. But I said, I would not request, I'm going to test it. I'm not going to test it yet. The whole time he's been building places to worship idols and all over the place, doing all kinds of wicked things. Hashem says, listen, you want to test me? Test me. No, I'm, I'm, I'm too from it. I'm too religious for that. I'm not going to test you. You're not supposed to test Hashem. I'm not going to test Hashem. I'm too religious for that. <laughs> so you got, you got to, the stories from the talk are so beautiful. Sometimes we, because they're human. You know him. We know human nature. There are people like this. You know, they can be the wicked. But you, you test them. No, I'm not going to test Hashem. God forbid I should test Hashem. What kind of wickedness you want me to do? But the next time he goes out and sort of worships what? No, this, this, this is the kind of king Achaz was. He was a wicked person. But when it comes to say Hashem said, No, I don't want. I'm, I'm, I'm too religious to test. So what is it? Okay. So here now, House of David, is it not for you that you scorn pro human prophets? That you scorn even Hashem? You scorn Hashem. You go make these idols and you don't want Therefore, my Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold the maiden. In the proper Hebrew, we're talking about Alma here. In, 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 in Christian ones, just have the version. Will become pregnant and bear a son and she will name, she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat cream and honey as soon as he knows to abhor good, evil and choose good. So when you get to a certain age, knowing what's good and bad, you know, you know, anybody's had kids, you know, say good and bad, then they're allowed to eat uh, cream and honey. Cream and honey you don't eat until a little bit older. Maybe like a year or so old. But before the child will know to bore evil and good, the land of the two kings whom you fear will be abandoned. Be wiped out to God. Hashem will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father, father's family days, because have not come since the days of Priam turned away from Judah, the king of a series of aviation. So what's going to happen eventually? The land's going to be wiped out. But when this child, this child's going to be assigned to you, that these are going to happen. Got it. it shall be on that day that Hashem will whistle to the fly that is the far end of the Jesus Church and the beat is the land of Syria. They will come and all will camp in the desolate valleys, in the crags and the rocks, and all upon the bushes, and all, all the brushes and the bushes. On that day, the Lord will shave with a large razor those who cross the river with the king of Syria, the head, the hair, the legs, and the beard, as well be destroyed. Right. It shall be on that day that each man will raise a heifer and two sheep, but it shall be that. From, uh, from the abundant production of milk, they will eat cream, and whoever is left in the midst of the land will eat cream and honey. So what cream and honey is actually saying that once these people are destroyed, it's going to be abundance in the land, where the thousand silver will come the weeds. One will be able to enter there only with arrows and a bow, for all the land will be thorns and weeds. But all the mounds that were hold with hoe, the period of thorns and weeds will not come there, but they will be for grazing oxen while of sheep. So what we see here is basically... Isaiah is saying, okay, you're going to be saved, and, and eventually these priests will be destroyed. 
So chapter eight, let's do chapter eight because chapter eight has a very much um, relationship. Take a large scroll and write on it in clear script. Plunder hastens, spoil quickens. In Hebrew is, uh, mm, where is it? The Maha Shalar Chashbaz. Okay. Now, I appoint first three words for myself, right? The coins, the Chari the Banachia. Uh, I approached the prophetess and she conceived and bore a son. Hashem said to me, Name him Machar Shalal Chashbaz. I mean, plunder hastens and spoil quickens. Again, very interesting point that we're going to discuss a little bit later on. Naming conventions in the Tanakh are always in order to um, deal with events. It doesn't tell what's going on. This child is not going to be a, a, a pirate or anything like that. For before the child knows to say, my father, my mother, the wealth of Damascus and spoil of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. Okay? So the Assyria is going to deal with them. Okay. We'll stop here because the other stuff uh, deals a little bit later. We're going to deal with all these things a little bit later. They're all going to come up. Okay. So, what have we seen so far? We have seen that Isaiah is talking about certain events that are coming. Okay. And also, if we look at, I'm going to pause that. If we look at the next chapter, we notice that Isaiah's son and the child that is born in chapter 7, 14, are, are contemporaries. So let's look at it. It says about the child, um, for before the child would know to bore evil and choose good, the land of two kings who we feel would be abandoned. Okay, we know they're gone. And what's it say about Isaiah's son? For before he knows to say, my father, my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Syria will be carried off. It's a little bit earlier, but again, it's still the same period of time. <coughs> Child born then. The reference there is to the destruction of Aram and for the end of the king of uh, Pekah and Amali. Now, a few things here that we have to know. So let's understand what, what's going on here and how we understand it from the Jewish point of view, from the biblical point of view, essentially. Achaz was a wicked king. We saw them were kings. And he rebelled against Hashem in many ways. Isaiah sent to him and goes, listen, you're afraid of what's going to happen. You should really be trusting in Hashem because you're going to have a child. There's going to be a child born. We, don't know. we actually do not know who the child's mother is because the word, word here is Ha'alma, which is the what's called the high idea, the no one, the maiden, the the or if you want to say his virgin, the virgin. Well, the why it's not the virgin, but the maiden or the virgin. It's talking about the meaning a specific one, which will be known to them at that time. So there's some woman there that that's being referred to, that they know who it is. We don't necessarily know who it is. Rabbis say well, it's either uh, his wife, or it could be for reference actually to Isaiah's wife. Um, we're not really sure which one it is, or it could be another woman. Um, there's a lot of things, and I don't want to get hung up in which one it is, <clears throat> because it doesn't make a difference. What's important is to know that there's a woman born at that time. She's going to, and that child gets to be a certain age. The problems that they have are gone. So that's what prophecy is about. Okay, it doesn't have anything to do with a child being born over 500 years later. Certainly we don't see in the time of um, Jesus that were two kingdoms, the kingdom of Adam and the, the kingdom of Israel, that were oppressing Judea at the time. Certainly under Herod, Herod, Herod was actually king of those in that area. So we don't see anything there that would tell us that actually relates to Jesus' time. This is clearly within a historical context. We see in the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, it's clear within historical context that Ahaz is afraid of what's happening, Hashem sends his prophet Isaiah to him to listen, I'm going to take care of this. But Achaz was so wicked, he didn't even want to, he didn't even care about that. But Isaiah said, this is what's going to happen. These are things that happen. He gives you a sign. The sign is going to be that this child, when the child gets a certain age, is going to be gone. 
same thing with Isaiah's child, he gets, gets born. Um, in chapter 8, same thing when a child is to a certain age, a little bit younger, uh, so it appears it might not be the same child, but there are some that think maybe it is the same child. It's, it's not relevant, but we see basically the time frame, what it is, is pretty much clear from actually verse 8 more than, uh, chapter 8 more than anything. The child that Isaiah gives birth to at that time is probably less, is less than two years old before they're both destroyed. And that's really what the point here is. It's telling him, listen, I'm sending you, this is what's going to be destroyed. Now, there are a number of objections that we find from Christians <coughs> on this. Um, before I, I do some of those, let me, ooh, it's already late, so I'm, we'll see what we can do. But let's, let's see what's here. Is there any question here that I can answer quickly? scanning now let's see what we got here still nothing guys remember if you want to get your question noticed be sure to put the Tanakh talk tag on there so it'll spot very easy otherwise we have a lot of right there. or write in big letters rabbi shulman please answer this or something <laughs> like that so we can see really quickly yeah actually actually don't don't use caps lock but what you can do is you can do the same thing to him you can put an at symbol yeah. And then put okay, Moshe Shulman, so. and then okay, let's start. Oh, Rabbi, really Rabbi, 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 one yes. second, one second, please. Uh, so you could tag anybody by simply putting the at symbol and then their name, and that person will actually it'll appear to that person in a bright orange, like a bright highlight. Uh, so you can either send that to Tanakh Talk or to Rabbi Shulman, and we'll be able to see those questions real quickly. Go ahead, Rabbi. Uh, Golem, uh, Golem one just made a point about translations. Yes, translation is extremely important. It is impossible, it's very, very difficult to go from Hebrew to English because there's not a one to one correspondence between words in the two languages. They're totally different languages. The nuances of the Hebrew language are so totally different that it, that it makes it very difficult. So what you try and do when you're going from one language to another is to try and make it as close to what it means there. And when I'm discussing with people, because you know there's nuances in English words that are not the same as Hebrew, I say, we translate it this way, but the nuance is this way, okay? Because it's very important to understand that the, the, these languages are just totally different. There's, there's no relationship with Semitic languages in English. English is, is a language that goes back to, uh, you know, Germanic. I mean, English is really a, a bastardized language. It's a mixture of Germanic, um, and Germanic languages, and French is in there, and a whole bunch of other languages get into that, whereas Hebrew is a Semitic language. Um, if you were speaking Arabic together, by the way, it would be much easier because from Arabic to Hebrew is very close, uh, just like Aramaic is very close to Hebrew. So the similarities are, are enough that even though we have certain um, changes that appear in words, so, so like, for example, the, very, the one that comes to mind is in he Hebrew, the word for gold is Zahav, whereas the, the word for gold in, in Aramaic is Dahav, the Zion and the Dalit get changed from one language to another. Certain letters that get changed, so you can see the difference between one, where you can go from one to another very easily and sometimes. <clears throat> okay, now, well, let me go back to this, and let's go to some of the answers that Christians say. But obviously, the Christians, you know, most of the ones you read have never, aren't aware of the similarities or, or the historical background to this, and how Isaiah actually fits very clearly into his story that we know from the book of Kings and Chronicles. We know that these kings disappeared within, you know, by, you know within a very short amount of time from when this event occurred. We know both these kings were gone, and eventually Syria was, was totally, uh, Aram was totally destroyed, was, and, and Aram and Northern King were eventually totally taken away totally from, uh, from their land. So, what are some of the what are some of the objections to what's basically the simple simple reading? One of them is there's a concept they say there's something called dual prophecy. Yes, this is um, a prophecy that applies to that time, but it also applies to Jesus later on. This is a very bizarre idea. Why is it bizarre? Because what it's trying to say to you is, listen, I sent a prophecy to these people to tell them something they're not going to know. They have no idea how to know it. Because they can see the prophecy being fulfilled in front of their eyes, but they have no clue that it's really talking about something else. 
And considering that Jesus' birth and being the Messiah, according to Christianity, is the Messiah, and he's supposed to save the people from their sins and all kinds of stuff like that. What kind of God is it that says two things at once? One that you see clearly fulfilled. Book of Kings and Chronicles show clearly is fulfilled what Isaiah said. These, these things are destroyed. So you clearly see that it's fulfilled. And yet the main thing, the what's that's most important, they should know about. It's hidden. Nobody knows what it means. Nobody sees it. Think about what kind of a God you're talking about. That clearly isn't the God that we see in the Tanakh, um, who, who's, who's, you know, not that way. In fact, there's a challenge I have out there. Um, and I'll repeat it right now. It's a challenge. I want somebody to show me in the Tanakh where there's a dual prophecy. Where a prophet said, is sent to say, listen, this is what's going to happen. And it gets fulfilled twice in the Tanakh. I would like to see that. Like, I'd entertain it. Um, YouTube, you know, there's people going to listen on the YouTube later. <coughs> Give me one. Show me the verse where it said. First fulfillment and second fulfillment, where you see clearly it's fulfillment. Now, I can show the exact opposite. In fact, I'll give you two examples today, and we're going to do another one next week. <clears throat> because I see it's already 10 minutes. Hopefully, we'll be able to do the, two of them. But let's do one. Okay. Book of Joshua, chapter 6, verse 26. Okay, now, the city of Jericho was destroyed. This is after the city of Jericho was destroyed. So what happens? The Yashba, Yehoshua, Ba'ais Ha'higayma. And Yeshua uh, basically swore the people to say, Ura Ish, if not Hashem, curses that person before Hashem, Asha Yukim, Ivuna Es who will set up and build the city, Hazos, the seer, Eshedicha Yericho, Bebechoidai Yisadena, with his firstborn, he will set the foundation, I mean, the death of his firstborn, if it's Eroi, Yatsev Dilosea, and with his youngest one, he will bury him when the gates, with the gates. So here we see a prophecy, Yeshua says, that the city of Jericho should not be built again. And the person who's going to do that, he's going to bury his first son, oldest son, when he, when he starts it, and his youngest son went in. So what happens? Let's go to book King, 1 Kings 16. Verse 34. Verse 34. This is in the time of the <laughs> Yumov <coughs> in the days of Ahab, Buna Chial, Bai Suayli, Es Yericho. That the uh, Chial, who was from the, uh, the um, from Bai Suayliya, built Yechiel, Bavira Bechoyla Yasta. With Aviram, his oldest son, he built the foundation. If a Sigiv, Tzirai, hits the Messiah. And with his youngest one, his youngest son, Sigiv, he built the gates. Kedavar Hashem, Asher Dibar, Biyad Yehoshua Ben Nimr. According to the words of Hashem that were said, Yehoshua Ben Nimr. That's what prophecy is. Prophecy in the Tanakh is, Hashem says it, and it's fulfilled once. That's it. Once. Jericho was built many times after that, but it did not happen anymore. Okay, Jericho exists now. It was built again. again. No. Okay, let's go to another one. We have another prophecy that comes here. Um, 
1 Kings 13, 2. 1 Kings 13, 2. Okay. Now this is after the revolt of Yeruvoyim. And he built an altar in, in Bethel. Okay. So Hashem sends a man of God, literally God-man, or man-God. No. And this is what he says. The Yikram is by Rekada to the altar that he built in Bethel. Bedvar Hashem, according to Hashem. The Yomer said, Mizbayach, Mizbayach, alt, alt. Koyrum Hashem, this Hashem. He and I been noyled by Stubin. There will be a child born to the house of David. Yeshayui Shmoy. And his name's going to be Yeshayui. Why don't you look at this? Prophecies are, 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 we're going to do a whole series on, on Messianic prophecies. Prophecies is no joke. Okay. When, when the prophet comes and says something, he says something very clear. What is he saying to him? Yavon, this altar, look what's going to happen. There's going to be a child born to be stupid, and his name is going to be Yeshayui. He's going to sacrifice. He will sacrifice, slaughter the, the priests of these high places that, that are bringing incense there. And the bones of men, he's going to burn on it, meaning he's going to, to desecrate it in, in, in the worst way that's possible. That's a pretty clear thing. Was that done twice? No, just once. Two Kings, 23. Two Kings, 23, verse 16. Talking about what Yeshua did, verse 16. The gam is a mezbaich hashir b'baisal. Also, the mezbaich the altar is in baisal. That's the one he's talking about there. Habum hashir uze yirevoyim ben nevan. The 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 the, uh, the altar the the boom because we want to hashir cheti yisusul that he caused the Jewish people Israel to sin. Gam is a mezbaich hahi also the mezbaich es habum manut es yisuf es habum hadik ufe besurf hashir. And he he did what he said. Next verse. And he went and eternally started of the graves. That's on the mountain. And he took out the bones that were the graves. And he burnt them in the fire. And he made them tumor. Because bones make something tumor. So he not only destroyed it, but he made it tumor that could never be used in the service of anything. According to the word that the, the man of God had said, that said this is going to happen. That's what prophecy is. It's not a thing as a, a dual prophecy. There's a prophecy. How about, Hashem doesn't waste his time with this kind of stuff. He says the prophecy. This is what's going to be. This is what it is. The prophecy is what it is, and that's it. There's nothing else. Okay. We're almost there, so I'm just going to do one more Indian that I saw brought up with related to this, which, which they sometimes want. It's very common to want to throw Well, the rabbis do similar things with verses. They'll interpret the verse as a simple shot, but they'll interpret something different, whatever. But that's totally relevant. First of all, it's not a prophecy. They don't say prophecies. Say, These are prophecies we're saying. Say the, the, the things. And number two is very important to understand that there's a difference between what's called exegesis and eisegesis. We've mentioned this before. I'll talk about it. Exegesis means we're saying what the verse says. A prophecy is only what the verse actually says. When the rabbis say something about a verse, it's not because that's what the verse says. It. There's a theological point, not even necessarily based on that verse, but they're using the verse to bring out certain theological points. And that's really a common type of thing in, in rabbinic literature. Um, we see it in Philo also, by the way. Philo also, his interpretation is very similar. But we see it in rabbinic literature. In, 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 there's a whole genre of rabbinic literature, the Midrashim, and, and even until today, you could take out this form by Hasidic rabbis. That, that's what they do. They take verses, and they put into those verses 
the use in their sermons, the verses, to use the language of the verse to bring out theological points. To bring out these theological points. It has nothing to do with what the verse actually means, but they're trying to bring out that theological point. So they use the verse in order as a vehicle for that. It's eisegesis, it's not exegesis, it's not a prophecy. It's saying that, yeah, you can understand this, this verse sort of hints at this kind of, but it's not a prophecy. It's totally false. I'm looking towards Rabbinic Midrashim, and there's a lot of fakers out there who try and do that, and we'll get more and more into this as, as time goes on when these come up. But this, this has nothing to do with reality. It's not what the rabbis believe, it's not what anybody believes. Okay? It's being used as a desperate attempt to try and support a theology which is just false. There's no such thing in the Tanakh of dual prophecy. There's nowhere you find in the Tanakh, in the Tanakh ideas of foreshadowing or typology. This is all things made up in the New Testament in order that you should be able to try, they should be able to try and say that we're fulfilling what the biblical prophecies in the Tanakh, and that's absolutely not true. Again, I, I, I'm going to give a whole discussion about the real messianic prophecies and where they are in discussing prophecy itself. That's one of those series we're going to do. You know, there's a lot of things I want to teach. Can't do everything at one time. I want to do it in order so that you know you can do it. As I mentioned, I don't hope my William doesn't mind. I now have a YouTube, um, a YouTube uh, channel, and if you go to my YouTube channel, it's Marsha Shulman. You'll see a picture of me on there. If you go to my YouTube channel, uh, I have organized up until now all those things that I've given, so you can look at the things over and over again, and review it. And we're going to constantly having it, so you can go back. I can refer back to things, but also so that it'll be available to understand all these things. And we're going to have all these, all these issues going to be discussed before we start going page by page in, in Dr. Brown's books and a number of other <coughs> recent books that have come out by missionaries specifically towards the Jewish people. Okay, that's what I'm going to do for today. I can't do the next issue, Indian, which is next about why Base Dovid is there. But I do want to see if there's any questions that I can take care of. Um, All right, I don't see any flags. You can check on your end. Yeah, if, if somebody tags you, like for example, I'm going to do it right now. I'm just going to put... Yeah, I didn't say any tagging. Okay, so uh, what is your what's your YouTube channel name? Is it Rabbi Moshe or it's, Mo it's just Moshe Shulman? That's all. Okay, I just tried to pull it. I don't want to confuse anybody. Just Moshe Shulman. And it has my picture on there, so I'm the only one who looks like me. Okay, all right. So that's I think what it, we have. And look there, what I'm doing is basically every time I finish a series here, I'm, I take down all the MP4s and I'll put them into one group. There'll be the, a, play, a whole playlist of everything in the order, so you can look at listen to it in the order as they are, and review it again. Or you want to look at individuals, that's all it is, but it'll be in the order. So you can go over these things again and again. Rabbi, do me a favor real fast. In chat, just just type hi real fast. I need to see something. Because I just tried to tag you and I couldn't. It may be because you haven't entered chat yet. So, and if this is the case, then what we'll need to do is get, uh, uh, like when you first log on, just just type in hi, everyone, and that way you might be registered in there. There we go. Oh, Reb. Okay, I just said hi. Ah, oh, it's under Reb Moshe. That's why I couldn't find it. So, yeah, I can tag you. Okay. So, I, just, so I will say hello every now, time. Now watch. Now I just I just sent you a message. It should show up in yellow now because I just sent something to you. Uh, actually, okay. I did right now. There you go. There is a little. Do um, you see red motion in the highlight now? No, not yet. Oh, it must. must okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I see it. Okay. okay. That's that's how it'll turn up. So, guys, one of you uh, want to tag either Tanak Talk or the Rabbi? Yeah. That, that, yeah. That is. By the way, that is very very good, guys. If you do that, I can go through back and see, you know, if it's a question I want to do. In a matter of a couple seconds, make it, right. It'll make it extremely uh, easy for me. Because uh, I, I do like to stop every once in a while to see if there's something I said. Because, I mean, I assume everybody understands what I'm saying, but I may be wrong. So I really do want to uh, do that. And, of course, remember, there's um, uh, there's going to be on the YouTube by Tanak Talk. They're going to have it. We can discuss there. Yep. And eventually it's going to be on my, my website, my um, channel that's going to be on there later. I put it on the channel after I finish giving it into Knock Talk so that, you know, William gets his uh, publicity first. Right. Thank you, sir. So, and what? I said thank you for your time. This is this is a fun uh, fun part of it for me. I like, I yeah. like this. Um, um, unfortunately, it looks like it's going to take me three weeks. Right. That's okay. Speaking okay. of three weeks, uh, I need to bring that up to everybody. I think most people knew about it this morning. Uh, March 20th, we'll be out of town for family reunion, but the following weekend is Pesach, and then the second, the, the weekend after that, will also be a holiday as well. So, uh, it'll be uh, it'll be 
three weeks, I think three weeks completely back to back to back yeah. where there won't be any shows. Uh, now there might, I might, I might have a, a, a Monday night show, uh, depending on how it falls with, uh, with, with two rabbis. So we'll see. All right. Well, uh, so you have a good, uh, a good night, sir. And, uh, enjoyed it. And we'll okay. look forward to talking to you again soon. Peace, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>